Um, uh, inst inst what's the word? Instrumental. Instrumental, that's the one. Um, in discovering and building up Mark, well, I mean, Ranosaurus Rex. Yeah, the these people, days. yeah, these people discover themselves, obviously. But I mean, he, he sent us uh, an acetate and some tapes when I was still on Radio London on the pirate ship. And I've always liked people who have sort of like extreme voices. You know what I mean? Uh, like Captain Beefheart. Anybody who's anyway, got like a, a different kind of a voice. So I was very much attracted to that. I made arrangements to meet him when I came off the ship one weekend, and uh, we got on really well. You know, and we did all of the things which hippies used to do, like going to Glastonbury tour. And I impressed him very much by knowing the date of the building on top of it, you know, and stuff like this. And we went to Stonehenge and, and did all that kind of thing. What, what was it about him, though, that separated him from the others? Because you've got a reputation of um, being a major breaker of new bands. What, what was it particularly about Mark that made you think this is someone special? Well, I suppose, you know, just, I mean, it's difficult to articulate that because it makes you feel good, you know, and you like it and you think you'd like other people to hear it. I used to get uh, booked to do gigs in places like Exeter. I remember going to Exeter University with them. And uh, I used to say, well, I'll come along and do the gig uh, if I can bring this little band with me, you know. And we used to get paid like 50 quid for the three of us to go there. And I used to rent a car and you could get all of the equipment that Tyrannosaurus Rex used into the boot of a Mini because it's all like uh, pixie phones, you know, and stuff like this and little uh, bongos. And stuff. So it was true then at uh, at one time, the, the rumours true that you, you you insisted that if someone booked you, then they booked. Oh, very much so. Yes, we used to. Time. We used to do a lot of that. And you even used to read stories, didn't you? That's right. Yes, I read a very embarrassing. Uh, an old skeleton jangling around in yes. a BBC man's cupboard. Yes. There. Read a very embarrassing. Actually, sat on the stage of the uh, Royal Albert Hall and read out one of Mark's stories. Which, uh, but these, this is not one of these. But these are uh, little books which he sent me. Little a bit of memorabilia. Yeah, like uh, back in the hippie Let's have a look days. At the there you camera. go. Mark's go. writing, folks. There you go, actually authentically. But uh, these are a bit scruffy because my children still read them. But this is quite a nice little thought because he had nice thoughts. What does it say? It says, uh, ills are merely one's bed. Illness. Is a illness is merely one's bed feeling neglected and making you snuggle in for a cuddle. Oh, so how sweet. That's very nice. Do you want to hear another one? Well, uh, sadly, there isn't time. Ah. And this is Channel 4. And we're now going to go and see <laughs> some of the magic of um, Mark Bowen and T-Rex. Um, so keep your videos running and now watch the magic with John and I. Besides being like an original punk in his way, he was the original Glitter King too. I mean, he was wearing glitter, as he used to like to say before Mick Jagger. <laughs> uh, you know, he was. He was the first one in, into all of that. Before mm. Bowie was dressing off really, you know, and they were great friends. Not a down on David. I just thought Mark was a great innovator. Anyone who does something like he did is definitely ahead of, of his time, like as David Bowie always was. Uh, Mark was certainly ahead of his time. He was a, a rock star in the days when it was very unfashionable to be a rock star. Everyone was sort of losing their egos, and uh, he was really building one up. It's often been said that Mark could only play about seven chords. Is that true? That's all you need. We got real friendly before uh -huh. the film, and he was he was uh, offered, someone was offering him money, a lot of money, to make this movie of his concert. And we were sitting around talking about it, I said, well, I was running Apple Films at the time, so I said, well, look, I'll put up the cameras and the crew and everybody, you put up yourself, and we'll share, because, uh, you know, everyone gets ripped off by those companies. But it was, it was a kind of mixture between the rock concerts, wasn't it? Was it Wembley Empire Pool? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, kind of mixed it between that and fantasy, wasn't it? Well, yes, because I was real bored. At that time, there was a lot of rock shows being filmed. And it, the atmosphere isn't the same when you're sitting in the audience in a cinema, you know. The, it loses something. So I, was, I convinced Mark that, you know, I think it should be more than just uh, filming his show. And so, you know, Mark, I think he loved more than being a pop star was that he, his big line was, you know, I'm the biggest seller po selling poet in Britain, <laughs> which he was at the time. <laughs> The 
one that brings a smile to my face is Hot Love. It's, um, it was the first time we actually used a drum kit. It's a, it's a lot of firsts in that. The first, the first time we used a big string orchestra. And uh, I remember it was number one for three weeks, and I went back to America. I could finally afford to go back to America on a holiday to see my little gray-haired mom and dad after three years. And I was there for three weeks, and I came back to the UK and found that, that Hot Love was still number one. <laughs> I think a lot of his music, like a lot of ours, holds up today, you know? And he had a certain, his music had a certain attitude with the words, and he did have a definite sound. And he was the sound. I mean, he could have played with anyone, but it was Mark's guitar and his, and his vocals that gave it something that, that remains. Well, that film really brought back some fantastic memories to me. And sitting next to me Anthony. is the Anthony. one and only Mickey Finn, who was Mark Bowen's partner and half of T-Rex, at least probably more than half of yeah. T-Rex, actually. Yeah, yes. Mickey, what memories did that film bring back for you, watching it? Well, it brought back so many memories in the sense that when I looked at that, uh, I just felt Mark was there because the energy came across so strong and it was so potent. But uh, his energy was so hard to deny, you couldn't help like his projection of himself, you know. What can I tell you? I mean, he could have edited, you know, edited that film himself. One of the things that most of the people that have seen that film said that there were bits where Mark turned around and looked that absolutely took took their minds and thought, well, this is happening all over again. It's like Mark is still here and this, that and the other. But uh, you were always the quiet one of the two, the two of you, weren't you? D but you were telling me just a minute ago that wasn't true. Oh, so did, I, did I say that? Did I say that? Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I was quiet in the sense that um, I used to keep a low profile, public-wise, but, I mean, I used to be the tearaway in cars and smashing up cars and bikes and, uh, and you know, if anybody should have sort of um, crashed in a car or a bike, it should have been me first, I mean, because I was the tearaway, you know? And what about all these rumours that were going around at the time that you and Mark were going to get married? Oh, yes, that was very true, but the thing is that... Uh, it's the only thing that me and Mark really fell out, fell out about, because the thing was that... Um, I was into long engagements, and Mark wasn't. <laughs> and that was very difficult with him, you see, because he was so, so spontaneous. He used to say it on stage, say. didn't he? Um, uh, by the way, Mark and uh, Mickey and I are getting married. So yeah, but, a... you know, he would never stick out for long engagements. What can <laughs> I say about that, you know? Did you ever resent the, the limelight that Mark had being right up front? Uh, no, in fact, it, it was a good thing for me, a very good thing, because uh, the fact that uh, I had nothing I could escape. I mean, my whole thing was escaping from the pop world, you know. You know, um, I was there on stage and I did my business. When I come home, my life is my life. I'm not mm -hmm. part about it. Did it, the whole thing affect your personal life a lot? Oh, yeah, with things like uh, doing articles for Jackie magazine, doing you know, mm -hmm. popular magazines with... Uh, and we'd be in uh, likes and dislikes, and, and then we'd say, what would you like, uh, what sweets do you like? And I said, will you fill it in? And they'd say something like, uh, jelly babies. 
right, and of course that would totally deny me. Uh, Wipe the floor with me, because like the next week for about uh, two or three months, we boxes and boxes of jelly babies through the door, boxes and boxes, you know. I saw the same thing with Duran Duran, with people posting teddy bears and things through yeah, the windows. Yeah, I mean, you can't say things that you like, I mean, because, you know. Well, is, would you do it all again? Yes, will you do I it all again? Mickey Finn will make the great, the great big comeback. Yes, I would. I would do it all again. That's super. Well, it's, it really is lovely <laughs> to see you. Listen, um, we're going to throw yourself over to... Oh, by the way, do you want your fee now? Oh, oh I don't know. Here's your fee. Here's the tenner for a cup of tea, Governor. Going. Is that all? <laughs> he says it's 12p. Oh, oh hang on a minute. Well, has anybody got uh, 12p Listen, yet? over to Jules, by the way, uh, in the studio is while I settle this man's Come on, it's getting embarrassing. You said 12 12 well, back now, of course, is John Peel, who you'll have recognised from earlier. John, you have, we asked you, when we asked you to choose a band that you'd like to see on the tube, you chose this next act, who we won't name yet. What were your motives for choosing this act? Well, it was, uh, it was difficult, because there were a lot of bands that I wanted to choose. It would have been easy to have picked somebody who was like, really obscure and difficult and, by and large, unlistenable, uh, the kind of bands that I play on my programmes at night. But uh, I wanted to pick somebody who was like, a favourite of mine for a number of years, and uh, funnily enough, they've never done uh, national TV in this country before.